welcome, welcome to our speaker, uh, Giancarlo Casale, who, who is going to give us what really promises to be a fascinating talk called The Prisoner of the Infidels, The Life and Adventures of Osman R. of Timisoara, an Ottoman Muslim in 17th century Europe. And as you, colleagues, you realize immediately what's so important about this is that it's a, a, a Turkish person, an Ottoman person, writing about his experiences uh, um, to visiting our lands rather than the other way around, which of course is so absolutely normal. I'm sure that there will be many questions after. So what I think we should do is simply welcome our speaker and go from there. So good evening and it's very nice to see you at our society. So uh, thank you so much and good evening to everybody and uh, apologies again for my confusing the hour. For those of you that were patient enough to come back, I absolutely appreciate it. Um, so my, I was a little bit uncertain about how to um, present this evening. Some of you might have read some of the text, some of you might not. I am not um, the author of this book, I am only the translator. And so I really wanted to make sure that um, Osman was front and center in the presentation. So um, let me start by reading, let's see. First, let me open the uh, share screen. Now I have to wait until I can see the slideshow. Here we go. Okay. So what I uh, what I thought I would do is start uh, with Osman's own words. Let me read to you the paragraph with which he begins his own life story. Allah, he of immense glory, has alone brought his servants from nothingness to existence, and through his might has preordained the lives and the circumstances of all. Anything that may befall a person, be it for good or for evil, is already known to him, the possessor of might and majesty. And so it is that I, a poor wretch from Timishwara, who fell into hopeless captivity in the hands of our enemies, now wish to reveal some of my secrets by relating in the form of a story, a share of the many adventures that have befallen me. Now, this is something that Osman sits down to write when he's a relatively old man. His autobiography is a little bit contradictory about exactly how old he was. He was certainly in his late 50s and possibly uh, closer to 70 when, um, when he sat down to write the story of his life, which is mostly focused, in fact, on events that happened much, much earlier, closer to uh, his teenage years and his 20s. And we have no pictures of Osman. In fact, his story invites us to ask a lot of important, profound, difficult questions about how we ourselves expect uh, a person's understanding of themselves should be constituted, in our narcissistic age, one of the things that we really expect is that a person should have a lot of picture selves. And when we talk about someone else, we are expected to have a PowerPoint presentation with a lot of pictures of that person so that um, we can get a sense of them. Without those pictures, we feel like we, we don't really know who somebody is, but that was not an idea that was shared um, by people in the 18th century, at least not in the Ottoman Empire. It was virtually unheard of for somebody to have a, pic a portrait of themselves made. Uh, and it was even more unheard of to sit down and write a story uh, of one's life in the form of a book. In fact, as far as we know, Osman is the first person uh, to ever have done that in his language. So we have no pictures of Osman, but this is a picture from the time in which he wrote from, uh, I think this was made in 1718, so just a, a few years before he wrote in 1724. Um, and there's something about it that really makes me feel like I'm looking at Osman. There's a kind of a sadness and a thoughtfulness and a melancholy in his eyes. 
self-awareness, but also self-doubt. And when I imagine Osman sitting down to write his memoir, this, is, this picture helps me really to visualize it. In any case, Osman wrote his book at the conclusion of which he compared his own motivations for writing his life story to those of the kings of old who believed themselves to be masters of the universe and then vanished without a trace. And in fact, this is what happened to the story of Osman's life. His book exists from the 18th century only in the autograph, so the copy which he himself wrote. As far as we know, it was never copied by anybody. We don't have any evidence that it ever circulated. It was never mentioned by any of his contemporaries. Um, there's no evidence that his contemporaries were necessarily even aware that he had written it. Who he wrote it for, what his motivations were in writing his life story, how he got the idea of writing his life story when it was something that none of his compatriots had ever done. These are all mysteries. What we do know is that his autograph copy of his manuscript lay um, somewhere unconsulted for 150 years until in the late 19th century, it was uh, purchased by an Austrian diplomat and uh, orientalist who was on a manuscript buying trip in Istanbul. He later sold his entire collection to the British Museum and that's how Osman's manuscript ended up in the UK. It was then ignored for another three quarters of a century until finally in the second half of the 20th century, scholars started to pay attention to it, mostly as a historical source. So as, as we just heard, um, for the early modern period, especially when it comes to ex studying the interaction between the Christian Europe and the Ottoman Muslim world, captivity narratives and travel narratives are kind of the, the bread and butter of our research. And there are literally thousands of texts that were written by European, sometimes captives, sometimes diplomats, sometimes merchants, sometimes pilgrims. But in any case, thousands of Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries traveled to Ottoman lands, described the things that they saw in writing and came back and many times published what they had written. We have almost nothing like that from the opposite direction. Only really a handful of sources that are written by um, Ottoman Muslims who traveled in Europe and similarly described their experiences. And Osman's is really by far the most detailed of any of those sources. So in the second half of the 20th century, scholars began to recognize the importance of Osman's text really as a historical document. And it was translated into several languages, first into German, then into Turkish, from, from German actually, not from Ottoman Turkish, and then some other Balkan languages, eventually French. But because it was being translated with the idea that it was first and foremost, form, foremost a historical document, these translations are very stiff, literal translations, allow you to understand sort of the factual content in a very clear way, but in a way that also really uh, limits the ability to access the literary voice that Osman was writing in. And so my main motivation in, in doing this translation into English was, was really to try to convey that, to try to give people a sense of this, not only as a historical source, but really as a work of literature, as a literary memoir, as the first literary memoir ever written in Turkish, uh, and, and, and to try to sort of enhance Osman's reputation, not only as somebody who had an original life, but who also was really an, an extraordinary original author. So with that in mind, what I would like to do with my remaining time is really just walk you through the narrative, share with you some translation from the text in sort of critical moments in the narrative, and then uh, maybe conclude with uh, a few observations that will lead us into a discussion. I know that uh, it's, um, it's a, a difficult to uh, listen to a 
Zoom lecture and the later at night it gets, the more difficult it is. So uh, I'm very sensitive um, of uh, maintaining your attention. So here we have the four main phases of Osman's um, narrative. Let's start with survival. Osman is captured. When he's, when he's captured, it's in a, a battle. He's a very young man, possibly as young as 17 years old. And the first quarter or third of, of his book is about the things that happened to him during the year, year and a half, immediately after his captivity. And, and it makes for pretty dark reading. He is despoiled of everything. He is subject to a full body cavity search to make sure that he doesn't have any possessions that have not been surrendered to his new Austrian master. He's beaten, he's tortured, he's given a chance to return home and re redeem himself by uh, borrowing his ransom. But then his master steals his ransom money from him. Uh, he's robbed, he's thrown into a dungeon, and uh, He's narrating all of this also with a, a certain flair. So you're getting a sense of the suffering, but you're also getting a sense of his own perseverance, his will to survive. And he also really wants you to enjoy the story. This is one of the things that I admire the most about Osman is that he's doing some, some really complicated things with with his tech in terms of exploring identity, exploring belonging, exploring the, the idea of relating one's own self to others, but he's also doing it in a way that entertains his readers very consistently. So I thought I would give you a, an idea of uh, one of these moments in the early part of his story, which he is both giving us a kind of a glimpse into his inner self, but also entertaining us deeply. Let me set the stage for you. He has been given the chance to go home, collect his ransom money. Uh, he's with some other captives that are in a similar situation. He's traveling back to uh, the Austrian camp on the other side of the border with a lot of gold and some gifts for his master. And uh, He's very hungry and he sees some people in the woods and he decides to ask if he can buy bread from them. And it turns out they are Hungarian bandits that uh, decide to rob and kill him. So he has been robbed and he's now has his hands tied behind his back and the Hungarian bandits are gathered around him in a circle. And he write, writes, while I lay there with my hands tied, they said, if we kill him on our boat, he's, he's on a boat at this point, our boat will be soiled with blood and ruined. So they brought their boat ashore at a deserted spot on the opposite side of the river, and they made me get out. Then one of them came at me with a sword and forced me down on my knees to kill me. By this point, I had abandoned all hope of survival, and I silently said the following prayer. O oh, most exalted Allah, creator of heaven and earth, provider of all things, your judgment is beyond question. If it is your will that I, your faithful servant, must die at such a young age and in such a forsaken place without having fully tasted the joys of life, then I pray that you might forgive my earthly faults through your grace and nobility. Then I said out loud, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one and only, who has no partner. With these words, I was ready for death. I looked at the blade in the infidel's hand as, if, as he readied his arm, wondering only if it was sharp enough to sever my neck with one blow, and if so, how much pain I would feel when it struck. Meanwhile, the others in the boat had disembarked to watch the spectacle of my execution, gathering around us and yelling, kill him, kill him, kill him. So th this is one of those moments where you can really just see the Netflix episode. This would be the very last minute of episode three, fade to credits, cliffhanger ending. We know he must live because he's writing his autobiography, but how is he possibly going to get out of this one? I won't spoil the surprise if you uh, end up buying the book, but um, the uh, 
He does escape. You uh, could probably guess that. And then at the, uh, at the end of an extremely heart pounding, exciting chase sequence where he's hopping along with his hands tied behind his back and then he jumps into a reeds, hides underneath the water, gets his hands free as they're getting loosened by the water in the stream and then manages eventually to scamper away to safety. At this point, he stops again. And after his bravado from his first encounter with the Hungarians, ready to death, looking at the blade, making his peace with himself, now that he's survived and he's alone, he has a complete breakdown. And he writes also about his complete breakdown. He says, thus, I was saved from those villains. Once back on land, I ran for another hour or more, finally coming to rest at an open place on the top of a hill, about a half an hour away. From here, I took a moment to survey the landscape, scrutinizing the horizon from right to left, but there were neither a living soul nor even a ghost to be seen anywhere. Even the sun was just an hour or two from disappearing. As I sat there, alone in the world, I began to reflect on my situation. Now what is to become of me, I thought. Forget about my hunger or the fact that I am naked and completely forsaken in this lonely wilderness. The truth is that sitting here, even before the sun has set, I can barely stand the bites of these mosquitoes, such that when night does fall, they are sure to be the death of me. So what was the point of all that effort and intrigue and no small measure of divine assistance to escape from those Hungarians? At least if they had made me a martyr, with one blow of the sword, I'd have been spared any more misery in this world. Better that than mosquitoes piercing me with their poisonous needles until my whole body swells and I die the death of a thousand cruel torments. I was in such a state that I even regretted having escaped, thinking that I should have let myself be killed. Breaking down in tears, I called out to God saying, O oh, powerful and exalted one, was I such a sinful servant to you that I must now face is such a middle death at such a young age? Is this your judgment? As I carried on weeping, I turned to the west, and my eyes suddenly fell upon a tree standing in the ruined fields that had once been the orchards of Sombor. Under the tree, I caught sight of something that seemed for an instant to be there, and then disappeared. I thought to myself, is this a man or a ghost or just an animal? If it is a man, who could it be? Then I thought that even if it is a man, there was certainly no reason to expect to be a friend in a place such as this. Then let him be an enemy, I said. I have nothing left to be stolen, so he can kill me straight away. And if you want to know what happens next, you'll have to read the book. In any case, this episode uh, comes in the middle of Osman's trials, which become progressively worse, if you can believe it, from being uh, naked, robbed, and facing the misery of a thousand mosquito bites. Eventually, he is uh, left for dead in a pile of manure. He's traveling with a, a group of Austrian soldier, invalid soldiers. Dysentery is rampant. He too falls ill with dysentery. He becomes so sick that uh, the soldiers he's traveling with decide that there's no chance that he will survive, and so they actually dump him on a, a pile of manure. And he explain, it, it describes in detail the experience of being delirious and thirsty and feverish on the pile of manure, and then after what for him seems like weeks, but in reality were probably a day or two, he's able to gather just enough strength to drag himself off of the pile of manure into a nearby house. And there, he experiences the first act of genuine kindness of the story, which is that there are Serbian families there. He's in, in Serbia at this point. He can speak Serbo-Croatian. His parents are actually both from Serbia. And uh, he asks for food. And it is uh, the, the time of the Lenten fast for them. So they have nothing to eat but some barley soup. Uh, but they share it with him, and they they 
continue to do so over the next several days. And so he actually is able to regain his, his strength. And this is a kind of a symbolic death and rebirth. Uh, physically, it's a, a kind of a death and a rebirth, but also symbolically, it's a kind of a death and rebirth. Because in the story, after this point, the, the most difficult struggle for survival, for physical survival, really ends for Osman. And he passes on to the next phase uh, of his of his story, which is the, uh, let's see, how do I advance this damn thing? Yeah, he passes to the next phase, which is temptation. In this phase of the book, he realizes gradually that he will not be able to return home, at least not anytime soon. And if he's to stay in infidel lands, he needs to decide whether he will keep hope of returning home, which means not compromising him, his identity, his religious identity, his emotional identity, remaining distant from the people around him in the hopes of being able to eventually go home, or to try to give in to the temptation of fully integrating into his new host society in the hopes of improving the conditions of his life, but at a very high cost, which is at the cost of never being able to ho go home again. So uh, one of the most interesting moments in which he's facing this transition, fight for physical survival to the fight for um, maintaining his own sense of self and resisting the temptation to give up his identity is in a, in a moment where his owner, his very cruel owner, Lieutenant Fisher, has left him behind in a Croatian village. And uh, he is treated extremely well by the locals. So I'll, I'll read you this passage. He says, here I continued to tend the horses, but when my work was finished, I had a chance to spend time with my new neighbors and the other people of the village, with whom I soon became very intimate. Men and women alike were most eager to talk with me, saying, a Muslim Turk had to our village. Some of them invited me to gatherings or to their homes to share food and drink. In addition, every day someone from the village would be charged with bringing a meal to my lodgings. And whoever it turn, whoever, whoever's turn it was, he would first come and ask, what would you like to eat? I would always answer, don't cook anything with pork or pork fat. Anything else you make, I'll eat happily. I also got an oka of wine every day to wash down my meal. Notice that he's very scrupulous about not eating pork or at least telling his audience that he's not eating pork, but he seems to have no scruple about drinking wine. I asked him that I stayed in that village about 15 or 20 days and I enjoyed myself immensely, even to the point where grown Croatian girls would take me by the hand, one by one side and one by the other, and bring me to their private chambers. They would show me every attention, sitting alone with me for an hour or two in the greatest intimacy and suggesting songs for me to sing in the Muslim or the Bosnian style. At that time, I myself was still at a tender age, having barely turned 18. And while I hardly counted as handsome, neither was I ugly since every creature in his youth can claim some measure of beauty. At such a stage of life and under such circumstances, it is no easy task to keep control of oneself when presented with such an opportunity. But the Almighty, exalted be his name, in his grace and goodness created me bashful, such that I let a thousand perfect opportunities slip me by. Then, while reasoning with myself, my libido would scold me, saying, but the opportunity was there for the take. Those fresh young girls were right next to you, and you knew how eager and willing they were. If you'd gone to work on them, what of it? You're a guest here for 10 or 15 days. What else were you waiting for? And with such thoughts, I would be overcome with regret. Then my judgment would answer these thoughts with more sensible ones, saying, here you are nothing but a forsaken captive. If you act improperly and word gets out, who knows what the laws and customs of this place are, and who can say what will happen if they decide to apply them? 
for one little moment of pleasure. You could be yourself in a heap of trouble. And what if you spread your seed and you leave someone with a child? Then what? So with such thoughts, together with my aforementioned bashfulness, I held myself back and a thousand opportunities passed me by. Now, this is, a, in fact, only the first of a whole series of parallel uh, incidents. He has uh, another story, which is with a boy. That one is quite interesting because, in fact, he's describing the experience of being exoticized because the boy is lying naked next to him in bed and uh, is asking him about the perversions of the Turks that he has heard so much talk about and wonders what they might be like. And, uh, and he also has a actually a phrase that's very complicated to translate in which he says, uh, I myself was very aroused, but um, was able to keep myself from falling into sin. There's another even more uh, sort of um, fiery episode with uh, a young girl who falls in love with him and en enters his room. And again, it's always the same. Also on his temple, but he then thinks he has this conversation between his libido and his conscience, and he's able to resist. Um, and then he also has other relationships that are more complicated in some ways with, with his owners. He has uh, two female owners in succession that become his owners after Lieutenant Fisher that he develops a very close relationships with, actually um, deeply emotional relationships with. And, and he describes those um, a, Again, in very similar terms, in both cases, these women want him to convert to Christianity so that they can be sure that he will never go back home and then that he will become a permanent part of their household and will always remain with them. And one of the things that comes out at the very end of Osman's story is that he actually, he's racked with guilt when he finally decides to escape and he makes his way back to Ottoman territory. He's, he's racked with guilt because he's so attached to this woman who is, is his owner, and he feels that he has abandoned her, even though she uh, has enslaved him. So there's a lot of com complex uh, complexities there. Okay. I have... Uh, don't want to talk too long. I've gone half an hour already, so I'll try to speed up a little bit through the last two phases. Um, the third phase of, of the book is the phase of escape. And in this case, I've lost the view of, uh, you guys still there? Yeah, okay. So in this third phase, Osman is, um, it begins with the ultimate violation. Osman is living in an um, aristocratic household in Vienna. There are several other Turkish servants that are his fellow um, slave. They were, they're, they're his work companions, but they are also enslaved like him by their owners. Two of them are women. One of them is a, is a young girl who's described as 14, but more like she's 11 or 12. And the, the man who is in charge of the household rapes her. And this is one of the only moments in the book. Most of the time, Osman comes off looking like a, a really nice guy. But this is one of the only moments in the book where as, a, as an interpreter, as a translator, I, I caught myself. I was so disappointed by the way that he dealt with this situation. And I asked myself if there was a way that I could translate the description that he gives of this episode in a different way. Because what happens is this girl comes to Osman and she says, I was raped. I don't know what to do. My sheets are covered in blood. I'm afraid. And he instrumentalizes it. He, he has this expression. He says, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. And he ends up telling her, it's going to be fine. And then he goes to this guy who's the steward of the household. And essentially, he blackmails him. He says, I know what you did. Um, I will keep her quiet, but you have to help me escape. 
this is the way that he manages to arrange for his escape. So it's prompted by this deep violation of a rape of a girl who is his countryman. She's actually from his hometown, this girl. And then he instrumentalizes that for his own benefit. And, and he tells us this story in a, in a very matter-of-fact way. This is one of those moments where I'm certain about how much I, I, I should read into this a kind of an allegorical meaning and how much it's really just him telling us in a matter-of-fact way his story. But what is certainly the case is that from this point, there's a complete inversion of what he's, um, the narration that he's making of himself. In other words, until this moment in the story, he's continually trying to show us how he's able to resist the temptation of being, uh, giving up his Muslim identity and staying in Austria forever. He's keeping true to his religion, he's keeping true to his self, whether he's tortured or wanted with sex or whether he's tempted with promotions, he's always sure of who he is. But after this moment, he actually he decides that the only way that he can escape is by intentionally assuming the identity of a convert. He buys German clothes. He dresses like uh, an Austrian. He tells people that he has converted. He forges documents that show that he has converted to Christianity and has agreed to stay in Austrian territory forever. And then he uses these things in order to arrange a very complicated escape, which uh, again, I, I don't wanna give away any of the details, but at the end of the escape, he's actually made his way to the border and he's just about to make a very dangerous cross the border, which if, if he's caught, he will be killed. And he has a dream. He's um, racked by, in, in the, so he has a dream that he's scampering up the mountain of Karlowitz, which is the mountain which now is the border between the Ottoman and the Habsburg territories. He's being hounded by dogs. He scampers up through the brambles and he makes it to the top of the mountain. And there's a palace at the top of the mountain. And he goes into the palace and he sees his owner, the woman that he has escaped from in Vienna. And she looks at him and she says, oh, Osman, don't be afraid. I'm glad to see you too. And then he wakes up and he realizes that he will be able to escape safely. This is really one of, one of the most um, uh, sort of profoundly ambiguous moments of the, of the whole story is that the, the moment in which he's able to finally achieve his goal and escape back to Ottoman territory, it's only because of this reassurance that he gets in a dream from the woman who has enslaved him and who has, he has lived with in Vienna for the last seven years. And, and then from that point, when he gets finally back to Ottoman territory, things don't get any less complicated. In fact, it turns out, again, I, I'll save the details in case you read the book, but the border itself, it turns out, is an illusion. The solidarity that he's been expecting to find from his fellow Muslims when he returns home is a sham. Uh, and the only heartfelt moment of joyful reunion that he experiences at the end of his story is actually many years later, he's gotten a new job as an interpreter and he travels back across the border to the Austrian side. And there he meets uh, the same general that was hunting him when he was in the last most dangerous phases of his, of his escape. And this general says, Osman, you look great. Your beard, it suits you. It's so wonderful to see you again. Uh, now I know that we're gonna be able to negotiate a deal because I have somebody that I trust on the other side. And then he, he holds his hand, he doesn't let his hand go. Uh, tells everybody that he's to be an honored guest for as long as he stays in the town. And this is, this is the only time when Osman actually experiences this moment of being welcomed back. It's not when he returns back to Ottoman territory, it's when he goes back across again to Austrian territory. So there are all of these extremely complicated um, narrative 
devices that Osman is using to resist what might have been a very easy one-dimensional story of enslavement and redemption. It isn't, it isn't really that. When you get to the end of the story, you realize that it's a, a much more complicated exploration of what it means to maintain a sense of self during an experience of slavery and whether it's even possible to go home after having an experience like that. So let me now end by, I wanna read you the, the last, very last part of the book, but before, let me just give you a, a couple of, um, let me end with a couple of thoughts about why exactly Osman is writing, which is a very complicated question. So uh, I would say there are sort of three obvious explanations for Osman's writing of this text. As I said, it is completely unique. There, there had never been a book length autobiography in Ottoman Turkish before Osman. Osman himself does write this book after a long experience of living in um, Christian Europe. We know that he becomes fluent in German. And so it makes sense to think that one possible explanation for Osman's writing this book is that he may have read things that were similar in German. Maybe he read captivity narratives or autobiography, various kinds of ego documents in German while he was living in Vienna, and then got the idea of adopting the same literary form in Turkish after his return. This is possible, but it isn't actually an explanation. The reason being that there were many, maybe thousands of people like Osman in the 16th and 17th centuries. Ottoman Muslims who spent many years in captivity in Christian Europe, many of whom became fluent in European language, many of whom would have had the same opportunities to read these kinds of texts in European languages. And yet none of them did what Osman did, which is to come back and try to reproduce this genre in Ottoman Turkish. So the fact that he might have been exposed to this kind of writing in, in German certainly helps, um, helps to understand the context in which he got the idea to write his book, but it doesn't really explain why he did it when so many other of his compatriots did not. Um, second possible explanation is this is a kind of geist of the tulip period. So he's writing this in the 1720s, many years after his experiences that he's describing in most cases. And this is a period of Ottoman history, which is kind of understood as this classic moment of opening up to the world outside the borders of the Ottoman Empire, particularly opening up to the realities of um, Christian Europe, and also experimenting with new literary forms in order to sort of capture this new spirit of exoticism and occidentalism. There were, in, in particular, there's a whole new genre of writing by Ottoman diplomats. There's a very famous account of a mission to Paris that was written in 1720 by a guy named Yirmi Sikhiz Mehmed Chelebi. There's another one about uh, um, uh, Russia that was written a couple of years later, another one about Poland that was written a couple of years later. Uh, there also um, are some books about sort of the um, political economy of Europe, one famously written by um, the same person who set up the Mutafarika Press. And so another way to understand Osman's writing is that he's trying to reproduce this interest uh, in the diplomatic view of Christian Europe. Osman is not the same level of elite diplomat as these other people writing these other texts, but he certainly is working as a diplomat and he might have had an idea that this was a way of buttressing his stature as a person who had deep knowledge of the realities of Christian Europe by writing this book. And related to this is the idea that actually after he wrote this book, 
And we know this from very recent uh, research in the Vien Viennese archives. Osman actually went back. He applied for a job to be the interpreter of the permanent Ottoman trade ambassador in Vienna and was awarded the job. And so he went back to Vienna shortly after writing this book about his escape from the infidels. And he spent another five years living in Vienna and working as an interpreter. So maybe this book was in part designed as a, as a testimony of his credentials for this job, having worked, uh, having had this experience. I don't really find any of these explanations fully convincing. I mean, I'm again, like the translating uh, from German explanation, it's relevant. These are relevant considerations. But when you apply for a job or when you try to impress somebody with your diplomatic credentials, you usually don't talk about your sex life or about bar brawls or about knife fights. Uh, these are the sort of intimate details that are, they just go beyond any of these instrumental explanations for what Osman might have been doing in writing this text. Uh, and so in the end, this brings up, brings us back to the idea that Osman is really a literary pioneer. Somehow he has this deep, innovative impulse to write his own life and to record it in a way that nobody in his language had ever done before. And I think that we really need to appreciate his text as a pioneering work of literature and not just as a historical artifact from his time. So it's an excellent example of the ways in which if you try to reduce something like Osman's autobiography to nothing more than a, a historical artifact, you're actually losing um, many of its most essential qualities. I think that's one of the frustrations that I had reading other translations of Osman's text in other languages. It's something that I really tried to overcome with my own translation to render the translation as literary, to recapture the literary voice on to the extent that I could. And uh, that's something that I'd be very happy to talk about with all of you. And to conclude, I, I will just end by reading the very last paragraph of Osman's book. He's describing heartbreaking uh, series of events that happened to him at the very end of his life. He is, um, war breaks out again. His entire family, is killed in a, in a tragic bombardment in, in Belgrade. All of his children and his wife are all killed. He also with his wealth. Uh, then his own hometown is captured by the Austrians <coughs> and he has to go to Istanbul in a kind of internal exile. So when he's sitting and writing his own memoir, the story of his life and his struggles to return home, he's actually in Istanbul and again on the wrong side of the border because his own home now is Austrian territory. It is no longer Ottoman territory. So he writes, by God's command, I have ended up in the imperial capital where I scratch out a living and spend my days preparing for death. Often I think of the wisdom of the prophet who said, this world is the prison of the believers and the paradise of the unbelievers. Truly, it is so. All I can do is to try to be satisfied with my lot and to pass what is left of my life with as much forbearance and serenity as I can. Truly, most magnificent and mighty Allah is the creator, provider, protector, and supporter of all his creatures. I take refuge in his oneness. Through my prayers, to the extent that I am able, I render him thanks and praise and beg through his kindness and grace that he might pardon and forgive me, together with the rest of Muhammad's community. Completed by the poor and humble translator, Osman Aga of Timishwara, in the Tophane neighborhood of Istanbul, in the year 1136, on the 23rd day of the month of Shaban. And for those of you who can't do the calculations in your head, that translates to the 18th of May, 1724. I think that's an appropriate place to end, and uh, I will happily answer any my, any questions you might have. 
Well, thank you very much indeed for a, a beautiful presentation, absolutely beautiful. One with achieved a rare clarity and structure that I think we can not only think about in terms of its intrinsic interest, but also as a model of a way a presentation should should be. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, just like colleagues, uh, 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 could you talk a little bit about, about his later career and what he got up to as far as you can piece together? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, we all give our solemn undertakings to read the book and perhaps even to purchase it if we can uh, find the web. Well, I think it's only 14 pounds. So, well, in that case, hardly, hardly probably, a better deal around. In that case, we can manage. So without wishing you to give away all your secrets, as it were, I mean, he got back. And clearly, clearly, he's, he, you know, what's he going to do next? I mean, are you able to just help about how he orientates himself again in, in, in Ottoman society? Yeah, so he is, um, at first, he's, he's cheated. Um, he is mistreated by the government official who's the interpreter who's supposed to recover his goods. He's cheated by the merchant who is supposed to have paid his ransom. He encounters all of these obstacles. Eventually, he goes back to Timishwara. He discovers that his brothers have been killed in the war. His sisters have died. So he has no, no more immediate family left that is waiting for him. And he job by the local Pasha as an interpreter because he has learned German very well. Um, and then the, the Pasha actually pressures him to join his entourage and go follow him around at his future postings, but he refuses. And he says, no, I, I want to stay here in Timishwara. And, um, and it turns out that because there are sort of a series of intensifying border negotiations, that Timishwara is now a border province in a way that it was not when Oshman started. Started his, that he makes a good career for himself. He becomes widely respected. Uh, there's always work. He, he gets a lot of contacts. He sets up his son with a good posting in the, in the army and he, and he makes a lot of money. And, and that's in the last pages of his book, that's what he, he says, I reached a point where I thought all of my, um, all of my desires have been satisfied in this life. But in reality, I was like, the kings of old who think they are the master of the universe and instead vanish without a trace um, because it breaks out again. That, this, is, this is the big tragedy of Osman's life is that in 1716, war with the Habsburgs breaks out again and, and that's a disaster because his own hometown at that point falls into enemy hands. I see. Yeah. Well, that does help us complete the story enormously. Please, colleagues. I I can see I can see um, a screen here. Gemma, yes. Please go ahead. Hi. Sorry, Simon. Um, wow, uh, Giancarlo. I want to get you one on one over coffee and throw questions and thoughts on at you because that was just that's just given me so much to think about. Um, I do want to hear some more about what you have to say regarding the sort of the the translating and and sort of the choices you make, particularly when. As you mentioned, you were working with something that had been treated as a rather dry historical document and you were making it very literary. But, um, I also want to pick up on the idea, one of the first things I wrote down at the beginning of your talk was, could it be classified as a captive narrative? And you came back to that, um, saying, well, maybe he read some in German during his time in Vienna. And I thought, it's really remarkable, this find you've had, because we're used to reading... Europeans writing about being captured by the Ottomans so this really is is sort of a rare thing you've discovered and I just wondered if it might be something again that spoke to his assimilation because you have said before he go he goes back on his own terms but he does he does kind of return and, and make his life there so that was kind of one thing I thought of and the other one was um well when talking about the different stages of his story, survival, temptation, escape, whatever, I recently um, I've recently done a paper on uh, the hero's journey uh, and how that mapped onto uh, a work of historical fiction. I was working with um, Ivan Vazov's Under the Yoke, um, which is a Bulgarian novel, and I was just wondering if 
you know, we know it fits with mythology. That's why Joseph Campbell created it. I've seen how it fits with the historical novel. I'd be really interested to see how the framework of the hero's journey fits on this autobiography you have. Do you have any thoughts about that or might that be something you look into moving forward? I'm sorry, I know I've said a lot of things at you, but this talk really <laughs> set my brain going. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so good, good questions. The, the question about translation, I will, I'll tackle first. So I don't know how many of you all have no, no Turkish or have ever read anything in Ottoman Turkish or even looked at something in transliteration Turkish. I mean, it's, it's pretty alienating. The literary style uh, of, you know, early modern Ottoman is extremely Baroque. There's a kind of ostentatious use of um, Persian and Arabic vocabulary, lots of allegory and literary allusions, and the whole idea of eloquence is based on the on the principle that literary meaning is not immediately apparent. It's something that gradually emerges and fully is understandable only by a chosen few. I think also the 18th century had the unique factors because I did I worked on the 18th century for my PhD and my supervisor actually said the 18th century you know the documents are, are very distinctive the primary documentation from that period yeah so the, the thing that when you read Osman it isn't like that at all it's it's completely modern I mean um, man, many people who have read my translation have written me and said it's hard for me to believe that this is not just a novel that you wrote. It doesn't seem like it could be a source from the 18th century. And that that's exactly what I was trying to do, because when you read Osman's text, that's the feeling that you have. It's so disorienting to see a text that is it's modern in the sense that it's very colloquial. It's short sentences. It's really trying to reproduce spoken language. It's and it runs like a train. And, and the, the, the narrative is the focus rather than the language that's sort of uh, shielding the narrative from itself. And so being able to reproduce that experience in a different language was really hard. So I struggled with that a lot. And then there are also practical elements too. You know, for example, um, Osman, he doesn't usually in, in Ottoman Turkish, you don't use I you usually refer to yourself in the third person. He refers to himself as we, which is not unheard of, but it, I think it's very important for him to be talking about himself in the first person, even though it's the first person plural. But I couldn't say that in English because that would seem like it was the queen speaking or something. So uh, uh, it's a different, completely different register. And <clears throat> so I struggled with all of those, those questions of, uh, and there's no there's no one way to translate. Of course, that's the great thing about translations is I, I can do this translation, and I certainly would be more than happy if somebody else did a different translation that was following a different kind of a philosophy of translation. That's that's the the way translation should work. There's no definitive translation, I think. Um, so the question about the hero, and there are some elements of, of that. Mm. It doesn't quite fit, you know. He's not. It's not boy born to greatness. Boy, um, a identity is obscured. Uh, girl is in danger. Boy gets sword. It's. It's. They don't. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that really. And uh, it's much more wrestling with with um, different kinds of demons that are that are emotional, they're emotional. He's, it, everything is well, about I mean, this. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that it might, it might say, I'm gonna buy your book, I'm gonna map the hero's journey onto it, and then I'm going to write to you and tell you about it and just, okay. just yeah. show you what. Okay, yeah, that's all, I, 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 I would love that. Angela. Oh, hi. Um, I would like to know, uh, if you've heard of the term the ego documents. Sure, yes. You know Professor Hassanola? 
the Lim Karahasadolu? Sure. Yes. So, so they, I mean, they just had a huge conference about oh, right. e-documents yeah. uh, a couple of months ago in Istanbul. Uh -huh. And one of my studio, I actually went and presented there, huh. uh, working on something quite different. It, it's, um, you know, that diary that also Jamal Kafadar wrote about, but he was right. writing about it from the perspective of the description of the plague. He's working on the history of disease. Um, so, and of course, this is all growing out of, there was a big German project about 10 years earlier about German ego documents, which fits perfectly for Osman because that's, I mean, he was living in Vienna in the, the late 17th century. So it, it, it really fits, of course. For me, what's different about Osman's book, it rather, I mean, it is an ego document. And there are lots of ego documents that people are now uncovering in Ottoman Turkish since they started looking for them. Right. But what Osman's doing, which those are not doing, and wh what's even different from a captivity narrative, there are some captivity narratives too, but he doesn't start with his captivity. He actually starts with his birth. And he doesn't end with his freedom. He actually ends with, he's sitting there writing the last word on the page. Mm -hmm. So it's more than an ego document. It's his whole life. It's very consciously constructed as the story of his entire life. It's not just a story of one thing that happened to him that he wants people to know about. It's his, it's his entire life story from the beginning to the end. And that's really unusual. That's something that it, you, I have never found anything else like that in Ottoman Turkish before Osman. Uh, sorry, not Jane Eyre, where, you know, she has, uh, I mean, in the, in that kind of, of novel, there is, um, you know, the, the same kind of things that you have highlighted in your four or three uh, phases, where you have to go through a kind of temptation, and then you're, you get a punishment of a kind for, for being tempt tempted, and then you are redeemed, as it were. Yeah. I don't think one is ever redeemed, redeemed but... <laughs> he well, he on. thinks he's redeemed, but that was his last mistake. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Just well, before we move on, could I offer, get another background clarification, which I'm sure will help people in their thinking. Sure. So where did he learn um, Ottoman Turkish in the first place? I mean, um, because presumably... You know, he had to go to a madrasa somewhere, or somebody had to be his teacher. Is, is do we have any understanding of that? Yeah. So he ah. he mentions in the very first part of his story right. about he's really from relatively comfortable family, and his father and mother die when he's very young, but he is left with quite a lot of money, and so he is sent with his brothers. He's actually sent to school, so he he is. He, he learns to read and write as a, as a boy by going to grammar school, basically. But he doesn't have a medrasa education. So that's one of the reasons why he's, his writing style, you know, that Ottoman writing style is really sort of produced by the particular education system that everybody goes through. And he doesn't do that because before he's old enough to do that, he's off in a, you know, in a dungeon in, in Bosnia somewhere. Okay. That's really helpful because the use of the third person, sorry, the use of the first person plural to, to talk about uh, oneself is in fact a rural uh, dial a rural uh, trope in today's talk. I mean, a villager could say, you know, we were a bit bored, so we came home. And yeah, know, right. Uh, right. John and the sickle, they never didn't do You know, they, they could say that yeah. today. And, yeah, and, that's and, right. it, but it isn't, it isn't Istanbul Turkish. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and so he, you know, he never lives in Istanbul. That's not his. That's not his life. He yeah. only goes there after Timisoara is conquered. So that's in seventeen eighteen at the earliest. He's never been there before. He's in his fifties. So we have a we have a literate prisoner from outside the elite circles captured whilst he's still young and therefore has the vigor to escape. Do you know, there may not be that many. You know, I completely appreciate that there are thousands of people caught up in this, in this almost miasma, but there may not be, when you actually 
sort of narrow it down a bit. There may not be so many literate provincial boys who are still have been to school, but are, but are young enough to survive the captivity. Um, yeah, that's probably um, right. That's probably right. Um, on the other hand, when you think about somebody who actually doesn't have a particularly extensive education to, to be able to write such a compelling thing yeah. just that from scratch, that's, it's also, it's, it's really surprising. In fact, I mean, it's such a hard sort of text to really get, come to terms with in, in so many ways. Absolutely fascinating. Well, we've got a bit more background. Who would like to ask a, a question to our speaker? Uh, Simon, did you want to ask something? Go ahead. Question, if she may. Uh, Janan? Hi, Janan, here. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for this. This is really most fascinating. I think this you are. I, I, can't, I can't hear so well. If you... Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. It's so interesting. I think you all uh, love Osmanaga already, and I, I look forward to reading the book. And I just wanted to ask that is, uh, as you say, it's a very curious uh, character and uh, probably why he wrote is because obviously because he could read and write, maybe not like other slaves, but setting apart from them. And uh, but um, is there anything in this, in his book, uh, why he decided to write at late stage of his life? Obviously, he wasn't a diary keeper, which diary keeping is not something slaves would be able to do. On the other hand, he's not writing things like Olya Celebi or Marco Polo. And uh, you say like he's got a this distinctive, unique style. Is there any likelihood that is actually uh, what he's talking about is, is fiction? And, and uh, or is it uh, definitely uh, he, he was in that predicament? Who was he really? Is there an indication what helped of him at this mm -hmm. stage in his life? Because most writers, something happens to them and they normally talk to somebody in their head, don't they? If, if it's literature rather than diary. Yes, so um, excellent question. The, the main evidence that we have to help answer that question is that he wrote some other things, uh, um, very different things, but still interesting and relevant. And I, I would have to say, I have not spent an, as much time as I could reading in, in depth his, the rest of his oeuvre, but everything that he wrote was that same little window of time, basically between 1722 and 1725. So it's, it's really, he's really like a, a tulip period author. And um, the, so the most interesting other thing that he wrote was a history of the Holy Roman, which was mostly based on a, a German history that he was translating into Turkish. And that is, again, it's really an unusual thing. You know, there are not so many, there, there isn't like an Ottoman genre of writing histories of foreign states that's established at that time. There is a, another a book that was written also in 1725, which is a translation of a Latin history of China that was uh, also done. So there, it seems to have been sort of a, a fashion right at that time to, to do these works that were based on translations of histories of other parts of the world. But it's interesting that Osman is one of the people that does that. As far as I know, there isn't any other his, history based on a, a German original that was translated into Ottoman Turkish. And then he has, um, he has a kind of like a um, collection of the diplomatic correspondence that he kept when he was the Terjuman in Timishwara with his counterpart on the other side of the border in Petrovaradin, which details, particularly there was a, a border commission and some other intense moments of correspondence. And he, so he sort of has this volume with his own letters and, and, um, and then his translations of the letters from the other side. And, and then he has, uh, and then he has another thing that was, it's just like a moonshot of his, uh, you know, for, for somebody who's doing his job. So you sort of put it all together and you can sort of see there's a coherence there. There's an intellectual project sort of linking all of these different texts. 
but this this one is the one that kind of stands out as the most unexpected it's this now i'm going to tell you about my own experience as a person who spent all of these years living with the infidels interesting thank you the thought Veysel abi. Selam. Merhaba Şankarlı. <gülüyor> Hello. Uh, ne işin var Londra'da? <gülüyor> I'm in Montreal. In the <gülüyor> uh, it's, it's so nice to see you all by that far. Uh, and thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we got the book. Uh, Vivian loves it. Uh, I read partially. So like uh, I have... Uh, I have a question that's due to my laziness in that regard, maybe that I didn't fully read the book and didn't look into the uh, Ottoman uh, original. So uh, again, a fascinating work and fascinating find. I mean, uh, maybe it's not like the first first find, but like uh, it's, it's, I think it's a great job uh, what you have done in introducing this fascinating source. So um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether you looked into it, but uh, maybe you already are. Uh, the, the the text of Kabudlu Wasfi Efendi, uh, which comes about like a hundred years later. Uh, it's much later. Uh, you know, this is the memoirs of an Ottoman mercenary who fought through Eastern Front against the Iranians, uh, some Kurds, and then, you know, goes to Greece and, you know, it's mayhem, pillage, and other adventures. So, like... Uh, they're like hundred years, but I was struck by you know some of the features of your text that you mentioned, like the colloquial Turkish, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I do believe you know you didn't come up with the text like this is <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> because you know if if one reads the this Kabullu Wasfi Efendi, the, like uh, you have I think similar uh, parallels and like. And hence my laziness, I didn't read both of these texts together. I read Kabul Lovasfi, of course, you know, I work more on right. the era. So like, my question is, like, if you had an opportunity to compare these two, uh, what, what would come out of it uh, in original Ottoman Turkish? And again, uh, as regards this, uh, you mentioned the provenance of the document, the, the, the adventure of the document itself. And then, uh, you know, the aim of the author, right? Uh, so like, with uh, Kabut Lovasfi, what struck me, and I think what Tolga Esmer wrote uh, as uh, as an article, uh, as a you know taking this as an ego document, actually Kabut Lovasfi found this memoir as an ego document, saying like this text is. I mean, we don't know where this comes from. I think we are in a darker spot than uh, your guy. Let's say for Kabut Lovasfi, uh, he I think makes a convincing argument that. Uh, this text is written so that it will be read for, if not masses, but let's say a coffee house full of men. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these histories of Weller and adventure, etc. I don't know whether you have uh, such a take on, you know, uh, for the, you know, prisoner of the infidels. So I guess sort of uh, long-winded two questions, but uh, thank you so much. And it's so nice to uh, see you and hear you again. Uh, well, well, so the question based on your laziness, but you've ex now going to expose my laziness. I do know about that text, but I have not spent <laughs> anywhere near as much time as I probably should looking at it. It's an excellent idea to compare them and as also from the perspective of the language that they're using. Um, the and I and I know Tolga's article, of course. The the I think. The myst mysterious thing about Osman's text is that, first of all, it seems like maybe he didn't, it was a rough draft, you know, it's, it's doesn't have a title, it, there are no headings, there are no page breaks, there are no, there is, it's just completely uninterrupted 60 folios, and um, and that was one of the things that I actually did with my translation as I, I made chapters, I made chapter headings, I broke the text up into paragraphs and those are those are my own interpolations, but I sort of felt that they were necessary to make it readable. And um, you definitely get the feeling that a lot of the passages are things that he has told many times. 
as stories. And he even sometimes says, you know, now let me get story. And, and then he will have a sort of an anecdotal story and it's neat, you know, it's page and a half and it just fits as a story, a self-contained story. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a part of, the, of, of a great big book. So you definitely have that feeling. It's not, he's many, many times told stories about his life to his friends and he's rehearsed because he's a great storyteller. So he's rehearsed them and he's refined them so that the effect is exactly the way that he wants it to be. And then he writes it down. But that doesn't answer the question of what was gonna to happen to the manuscript. That's a little bit more mysterious. Yeah, and I guess we are at sea in general, right? With documents like this and just really happy when they just pop up, I guess. And one wishes that they pop up more often. Than <laughs> right? uh, just a, a quick, quick follow up. Like this Kabulua Sphere Fandi guy has some doodles. Uh, oh some, wow! Okay, sketches and the original document. Like mm -hmm. he draws. Like yeah, I, I would say some doodles. Yeah, like a like a, or a Greek head. Like he draws. He draws like a city, the town that he passes by. I mean, not like a whole page, I guess, but. Um, so like, I don't know, is there anything like that? Like other than, let's say the calligraphy on, on the text that you dealt with? No, there isn't, there's nothing like Just that. Just the text. Yeah. Okay. I wish there were because, you know, he, he actually mentions in a few spots that he is um, negotiating with, um, mm -hmm. what the hell is that guy's name? There's this interpreter that, that what the hell is his name? Mark Antonio. Uh, anyway, this this guy the hat does have some maps, and they're working on a border commission, and 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 it seems like they actually became relatively close friends. So you can imagine them sort of sitting and 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 working with maps. And um, and I'm reading now, but the next thing I'm writing is actually about these Sephardet names, these Ottoman ambassadors' travel narratives that are from the same time, and there are some pretty interesting discussions of maps in those. There's this one where the guy who goes to Nishli Mehmed Efendi, the guy who goes to Moscow, he actually has this, he's at a dinner party and the, the czar, Peter the Great, shows up unannounced at the dinner party. And then he takes him into the map room and they are looking at the map together. And Peter the Great keeps asking him, do you, do you understand what you're looking at? Is this clear? And he says, yeah, 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 it's clear. And they sort of work out all the different territories and where everybody should keep their troops. And it's, it's quite interesting in that respect. So yeah, I wish there was something like that for Osman. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it's not it's narrative, of course, but of course it's also, it's also an old man with no family left. It's a memory narrative, isn't it? And there, there is, there is a, such a strong later uh, genre. Do you know, I'm just reading at the moment, um, what is it called now? Is it called Adam Agop? It's the, it's the 19, the guy who was brought up in Tokat uh, in, this, in some sort of remains of, sort of Armenian households. Okay. Um, and he's absolutely loves lessons and, and writes and goes to Istanbul, even though he leaves Tokat so early. He then writes and writes and writes and writes until he finally goes to Canada. He may even still be alive. Um, if he's, he'll be in his 90s now if he's still alive. Uh -huh, and, wow. and then he writes these very, very beautiful memoirs or just a page. But these intense, tiny little ethnographic scenes of things that happened in Tokat during his childhood or before the age of 14. Yeah. Um, so it's this intense dislocation as well, isn't it, that's encouraging this chap to write. Yeah, and it's also, there are some moments where he contradicts himself. He, mm. many times he says, I was so young, I was only 18, I was only 17. But actually, relatively close to the beginning, he says something about his mother and mentions how old he was when his mother died. And if you do the math, it actually, it means that he was much older than he says he is everywhere else. So then that makes you think, hmm, is, is it, did he just make a mistake there? Or is there some sense and wants everybody to think that he's a much younger person with an unformed personality in order to give more meaning to the story? Whereas if he were already, you know, 
in his late twenties, it wouldn't really be the same, wouldn't really be the same sort of tragedy. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's one of the things that I sort of wonder about without drawing any conclusions in my introduction, because I did notice that there is this big contradiction about how young he actually is. And then there's this discovery that David Dopaso made just finishing writing the introduction, which is that we know that Osman went back again, which is something that nobody knew before. So that also makes everything much more, that more, much more ambiguous. He's telling us about his escape and his return to Ottoman territory at exactly the moment where he's voluntarily going back to live, you know, permanently in Vienna. So, <laughs> so it gives a different color to the whole, to the whole experience. Well, that's where Noah Malcolm's work, of course, is so useful because he really highlights in a way, I think, that nobody had done since Hazlitt, really, um, about the way that you can move fluidly. So, we, yes, we have millet systems, but at the same time, we've got this incredible possibilities of leaping from one to the other and sometimes getting forgiven, sometimes getting your head chopped off. But, you know, by and large, it, it, it's a game that, a real serious game that's sometimes worth playing. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I and, 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 I, and I think also one of the things that surprised me about the story is that I knew that that was the case for people that came to the Ottoman side, right? It's, well, it, it's, it's quite minted that if you show up in the Ottoman realms and you agree to become a Muslim and you are, you know, belong to the right household, the sky's the limit. That's the main way that, that's the system of elite formation in the Ottoman Empire. But I didn't really think that there was anything like that on the Habsburg side. But what I can see from the story and the way that everybody is trying to get Osman to be their client so that they can promote him, it seems like that was a very much an element, at least of his own, is that the aristocrats that he belongs to are trying to emulate the Ottoman system in some sense. And has there been any question about the veracity of his writings? I mean, you, you, of course, when you get this type of manuscript, the, the literature, historical analysis is full of the, hmm, you know, did he really go there? Uh, did you come to any firm conclusion about that as you were? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think that it's an question to answer in some sense, but in the other sense, I, I would like to. Uh, I would like to think that is not all true. And the reason why I would like to think that it's not all true is because for me, it's very important to understand that this is a constructed text that is a yeah. literary milestone. And if it isn't, if it, all it is is just somebody telling all the things that happened to him, then it isn't that. It just happens, it just appears like that to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a really good answer. I mean, that's why... That, that's why um, uh, Boswell's Life of Johnson remains such an incredibly enticing text. I and mean, we've got a guy who's a failure. He's, he's a whoremonger. He's, he's a liar. He's a drunkard. He's a failure <laughs> at everything that he does. And yet, and yet, and yet, he's produced the finest detailed account of, of a literary figure that may even still exist today. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, more questions, please, for our speaker. Please, please, please just jump in. Yeah, may I just uh, make one other comment listening to this, and I'm not an academic um, in that sense of the word, but uh, is it possible these documents are lying around for hundreds of years, passing between merchants sold, and that kind of thing, um, that either at the time he wrote them, uh, the very conservative Ottoman society possibly wouldn't have welcomed that kind of expose a uh, text, particularly when you're describing, as you eloquently <laughs> sidestepped around some of his sexual encounters or possible sexual encounters. And then maybe there was an element of um, censorship or, or even self-censorship, whereby he thought, oh, maybe that's going a bit far, perhaps I better not. And perhaps the, the story was moved around a little uh, and 
eventually that maybe that's why it was never published and or maybe there's some manuscripts that are missing from it because either he felt he couldn't really ink them or maybe they were taken by somebody else is have we got the full story do you think or do you think there's still perhaps papers out there or papers missed or missing or damaged or lost mm -hmm. uh so this it says i'll answer your question in a slightly roundabout way but the one of the things that really bothers me is i read this text and it speaks to me really directly and i think most people that i know who have read it today have a similar feeling but clearly that was not the way people felt in the sense <laughs> in the 18th century they they didn't they, it didn't speak to them now i don't know if that was because of censorship there there are lots of really dirty things in ottoman turkish so it's not it's not a problem to talk about sex per se but somehow it wasn't compelling for them at least it doesn't seem to have been because it seems to have not circulated or inspired anybody to make copies. And it's we have a lot of cases like that, you know, Evliya Celebi's Seyahat Name, which anybody who reads that now says, wow, what a fantastic source. This is just unbelievable. It's historically rich. It's a, a great read. It has all, all kinds of ethnographic details. As far as we know, nobody ever bothered to read it or at least it only ex it's existed in a single copy that nobody cites and and then in the 19th century it gets discovered there are lots of there are lots of examples like that somehow the the what was compelling to people in the ottoman empire in the 18th century was just profoundly different and uh, i mean that's our problem more than it's their problem i think a lot of people you know i don't know if if i don't want to i don't want to pick on him because He's an excellent scholar, and he had also a terrible stroke. But Dan got this book, which is called The Ottomans and Early Modern Europe. And I think it's a great book, and it's making a very important point, which is that you can't really understand Ottoman history or early modern European history except as interconnected. But he does this thing there, which is that because we have this expectation that there must be travel accounts, and he wants to have a travel account of an Ottoman visiting European places to make his point. But there is no sound. He actually has these little vignettes about this guy named Kubad, Chuvash named Chavush named Kubad, who, you know, first it's his childhood, he's captured by slave uh, by slavers, then he goes on a trip to Venice, then he goes to Marseille, he recounts all of his experiences. They're all plausible, but Goffman made them up. And he tells us that he makes, it's not, he's not tricking us. He tells us he's making them up. But the fact that he's doing that to fulfill an expectation of the reader is actually making things a little bit too easy on us, I think. This is one of the things that I wanted to get to in my introduction is, yes, this is a book that fulfills exactly our expectations of the Ottoman version of a European Orientalist text or a European captivity narrative, but it isn't that all we need to do is just go look for more of these because there are hundreds of them lying around. There, there's some reason why they didn't write them and we don't really understand what that reason is, but somehow this way of, of writing about oneself and others and life, it, it, it didn't speak to Ottoman readers in the 18th century. I don't have a good explanation of why that is. I just, I just want to say something. What's going to happen is that to thank I mean, two moments, I think, when you discover one of these manuscripts that's written by a woman from that period, that would yeah. be so fantastic, and I really look forward to that. <laughs> so let, let me say that I absolutely agree with you, but one of the really interesting things about Osman's own text, which I did not talk about much today, is it has un unbelievable female characters. Unbelievable. And, and there's one who is a cross-dressing soldier who is only discovered when she gets wounded in battle. And the, the battlefield, during battlefield medicine, they open her clothes and realize that she has, she's a woman. There's, a, there's another woman who escapes with Osman, who has a parallel story to Osman. So she was 
taken prisoner at the with in the conquest of um, Buddha, I think. She's claimed by a low-ranking officer, but she's so beautiful that the commanding officer sees her and says, I'm claiming her. And it's my right as commanding officer to claim I want. And then the other officer says, I would never give her up and takes out his pistols and shoots her in the head, says, I would rather kill her than have her belong to somebody else. She survives two shots to the head. Uh, and then this commanding officer who is a nobleman from uh, Alsace-Lorraine brings her to his homeland in Alsace-Lorraine to convalesce. She escapes, travel way across Europe somehow by herself until she gets recaptured in um, um, Hungary. And then she ends up in this household as a servant with Osman, and she finds out when he's going to escape. And she comes to him and she says, you have to take me with you, otherwise I'm going to tell everybody your plan. And so she, he says, okay, and, and then brings her with him and, and she makes it back. He never gives her name, so we can't actually track down the story. She's actually only one of several really interesting female characters. And there is, again, this is something else that really, there isn't anything like this in Ottoman uh, in Ottoman literature that I've seen. So it's another one of the ways that he really is a surprising author. Wow. And the only other thing, of course, is, is in his work as an interpreter, he, 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 he got used to this literary genre of explaining and, 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 and certainly oral texts, at least, even if not written ones. It, it might just be possible that he gained experience in writing in some of his professional work, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, Stefan Hans has this book that's coming out and he he showed me uh, a, a manuscript. He comment on it. And it's about, it's the biography of a Venetian uh, dragoman from the late 17th century. And he's making that argument pretty strongly. He's basically saying that translation is a kind of self-representation. And so he's putting together all of the different things that he, this guy translated and the ways that he translated them and, uh, and, the, and the, when and under what circumstances. And then he's basically trying to show systematically that he's making interviews translations. The point being, rather than translation being invisible, translation should actually be understood as a, as a kind of self-representation, which is, it's a very, Interesting way to, to think about Osman also. Yeah, it sounds to me com completely convincing. Yeah, absolutely. A any more questions for our speaker who's perhaps understandably uh, just sounding a little bit hoarse? Um, I <laughs> hope <that> you have <laughs> but, um, I just started a new job as director of graduate studies this week. So uh, I've been talking to a lot of students about things that I don't really understand. Well, certainly this evening you've talked to us about something that you do understand. <laughs> so I, I think we just to thank our speaker and, and say, say that now that we've got to know each other, we hope very much that we'll have the great pleasure of welcoming him to this country one day. Um, <laughs> but but um, uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. Let's have a round of applause. Thank, thank I, everybody. I Thanks. To, nice to see old friends. Nice to meet new friends. I, I look forward to the next occasion. Yeah, likewise. Thank you.